Welcome back to the NATO Public Forum. I'm Nadia Shadlow, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and it's my pleasure this afternoon to have an opportunity to have a conversation with Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis. Um, Prime Minister, it's really great to be here with you today, and since we only have a few minutes, um, I wanted to jump right in. Uh, when you became Prime Minister first in 2019, Europe looked different. Um, and, and the challenges facing NATO seemed perhaps less intense than what we're facing today. So could you talk to us a little bit about whether or not NATO has been adapting enough since 2019, since 2022? Uh, I know Greece has been really in the lead in terms of modernization and adaptation, um, but I'd love, love to hear your views. When I became prime minister in 2019, no one thought that we would be faced with uh, a war at the heart of the European continent. But this is what we have to deal with after Russia's unprovoked uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and I do believe that uh, the alliance has uh, adjusted uh, and has tackled uh, this momentous uh, challenge uh, as successfully as it, uh, as it could. Back in 2019, uh, we were still faced with the question of whether enough European countries would meet the 2% uh, commitment, 2% uh, uh, of defense spending as a percentage of, uh, um, uh, of GDP. Uh, now most countries have already met that target, and those that haven't have made very clear pledges that they will uh, do so. Greece has been one of those countries yeah. that has surpassed the 2% uh, threshold uh, ever since essentially we joined uh, the uh, alliance. We'll be spending 3% of our GDP on defense, significantly modernizing our uh, armed forces, uh, and thus contributing to the uh, overall capabilities uh, uh, of the alliance. So new challenges uh, force us to, to think differently also in terms of what this means for the collective European security as a pillar of the overall NATO integrated uh, structure. And I think this discussion is advancing at a very fast pace in Europe. Yeah, so you mentioned European security. How do uh, uh, EU defense um, measures complement NATO or how do you see the relationship between EU uh, efforts to increase and, and substan uh, substantially increase its defense and, and NATO? Is the relationship complementary and how so? In my mind it is fully complementary. We need to spend more but we also need to be smarter about how we uh, allocate our uh, defense spendings. When I look at the European defense industry I see a lot of fragmentation. I don't see enough interoperability. Uh, I, I see a lot of sometimes maybe, you know, I would say, I wouldn't say a necessary competition, but certainly too many uh, weapons uh, systems that don't necessarily talk to, uh, to each other. Uh, so we need to spend more, but we also need to be smarter about how we integrate our spending. And I guess I do think that at a time when um, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine poses an existential threat for Europe. We also need to be creative in terms of uh, uh, finding new sources of funding in order to support our defense spending. It is not just going to be enough to rely on national budgets as we have done so far. And that is why I've been one of those uh, strong proponents that we need uh, some sort of European uh, facility that will complement the defense spending that we undertake at the national level with more European funding. Uh, so this combination of public and, and private uh, initiatives in my mind is going to be necessary if we build uh, a solid uh, a European pillar when it comes to NATO's uh, overall um, uh, defense capabilities. So with that be some type of European fund or how do you envision that that um, that mechanism? We have uh, um, submitted with President Donald Tusk uh, uh, a proposal for um, uh, a flagship European project uh, which would essentially be a European uh, Iron Dome that would complement the existing air defense capabilities that we have which could be again I, I stress the word could be because we clearly don't have agreement at this stage which could be funded through some sort of European uh, joint uh, borrowing. Uh, when we faced COVID back in 2020, we took the momentous decision to raise 750 billion euros um, uh, to address the economic downturn that uh, COVID caused to all of our economies. And this money is currently deployed. This was a European facility. So it seems to me that if we have raised 750 billion euros um, for the green of the digital transition to support our competitiveness, to protect jobs, it would be reasonable if we, if we could raise a significantly lower um, uh, sum at the European level to strengthen our European defense initiatives.
Right. And that would get uh, us beyond always a discussion about the 2%, right? Also, it's different. It's ways to get to the 2%, but also ways to increase capabilities and integrated capabilities. And, of course, also ways to, to strengthen also our... Uh, our European defense industry at a time when we talk a lot about strategic uh, autonomy, when the issue of competitiveness is at the top of our uh, agenda, bolstering uh, European defense uh, cooperation, European innovation. We've, we've made some first steps uh, at the European level in that uh, direction, but we clearly need uh, to, do, uh, to do more. And speaking of doing more, Greece has done an incredible amount for Ukraine. You're one of the leading states in terms of providing the Ukrainians with missiles, with ammunition. What more do you think NATO needs to do quickly, um, and how can we get there, right? A key theme throughout this past year really has been speed and NATO's ability or lack thereof to get things to Ukraine fast enough. And that's been a problem we've had in the United States, too. Um, how do you think things might shift over the next few months, or what could be most meaningful to get us to act faster? Well, first of all, I think Europe has stepped up to the plate and has delivered. Back in 2022, I think many, uh, including many in Moscow, would have placed bets uh, on the inability of Europe to remain united when it comes to supporting Ukraine. They were wrong. Europe remains united. Uh, we are providing uh, Ukraine with European financial assistance, you know, 50 billion euros. It's a significant uh, package that we agreed a few um, months ago, but also member states uh, are providing uh, Ukraine with uh, uh, defense uh, capabilities uh, to, the, to the best of our abilities. And we will uh, continue to do so. And initiatives such as the Czech initiative, for example, have proven to be a very uh, efficient in terms of delivering uh, aid to Ukraine as quick as possible. But at the same time, we need to look at uh, the holes uh, this has created uh, uh, to our own uh, defense uh, capabilities. And as much as we talk about sophisticated uh, uh, systems, we also need to make sure that we have the basics. Uh, I mean, Ukraine demonstrated how important, for example, 155 shells uh, are and that not everything is going to be uh, sort of as technology driven in, in, uh, in a modern war as man many people uh, thought. So making sure that we also streamline uh, production, uh, um, uh, strengthen our um, uh, our stockpiles, while at the same time uh, having the capability to support Ukraine. This is a challenge that we have to meet. Right. Quantity matters. <laughs> Quantity and quality. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? Well, I think the truck is, is has proven to be an efficient, um, uh, an efficient way of uh, uh, of, uh, of of transferring um, uh, weapon systems to uh, to Ukraine. Uh, many countries have uh, have joined that. Uh, uh, initiative uh, and as you pointed out now it's just up to speed and making sure that the necessary uh, transactions so whenever they involve for example sale of equipment uh, uh, take place as quickly as possible and uh, uh, it seems to me that this is this is one avenue which is worth uh, exploring further